Recording. <laughs> recording. Recording year. When that strange new world collided into ours, we just built bigger bombs. I'm Anthony. I'm Damon. I'm David. I'm Kirby. I'm Katie. And I'm Jim. Welcome to issue number 167 of the Crimson Call Comic Club Podcast. Each and every week we meet here to talk about comic books. This week's issue, we've got a club discussion on issue three of Crossover. Then we will jump into weekly reviews, talk about the books that we've been reading, both new and old. Then we have a letters page question we will answer, which is, in the spirit of WandaVision, streaming now on Disney+, Plus, what two characters would you give the sitcom treatment to for a television show? So we will talk about that in the letters page towards the end of this program. Um, but first, we got to jump into our club discussion. And once again, we are talking about crossover issue number three. Monsters and robots falling from the sky? Mysterious and familiar superheroes joining our intrepid gang on their journey to event ground zero? Crossover continues with these, uh, with the series' most explosive and shocking issue to date. Three issues into the series, and this is the most shocking one. <laughs> uh, don't miss this one, folks. All right. Um, crossover is a series where the comic book world uh, kind of exploded into our world, and a bunch of chaos happened, superheroes and villains, and a giant bubble going over uh, Colorado, and... Uh, we pick up with our main character, uh, Elle, Ellie, who is uh, wearing a domino mask. She works at a comic shop for a guy named Otto. And they discover this little girl named Ava, who is somebody that came from the crossover world, which she has the classic comic book uh, dots on her face. And everyone kind of freaks out on uh, the inside of the comic shop, a world where uh, comic books are... Uh, looked down upon there's a religious group that are kind of uh protesting outside of comic shops and talking about uh you know the why how capes and superheroes are bad and all that kind of stuff um so there's some stuff going on outside the comic shop where this kid ryan who is the son of a clergyman who was kind of felt pressured into doing this thing and he basically sent a, a pipe bomb into the comic shop the whole thing kind of blew up and chaos ensued and our Otto and Ellie and Ava, our three main uh, quote unquote heroes, I guess, of the story are out on the run as Ava says that there was somebody who helped us, uh, that she escaped from these camps that were, uh, you know, from outside of the bubble of all the people that kind of were stuck on the outside of it. And she drew this picture of a, you know, a guy with a cape and a giant uh, S looking shape and kind of resembled, you know, how a, young young child would draw maybe superman and uh so they're on a journey to try to find um this person that helped her escape from these camps because they kind of want to go in and find a way to get inside this dome and uh basically find her parents and ellie to find her own parents uh that's kind of the oh yeah then the ryan that uh the, the guy who had uh contributing to blowing up the comic shop he was given this uh kind of this magic gun with their magic bullets basically to kind of kill superheroes the government kind of put him aside and uh, gave him this weapon which he's kind of 
keeping in a bag and he's running away from home. Uh, so that's kind of basically the overview of what's happening in the series thus far. Um, this particular issue deals with, uh, right, we'll kind of start right in the beginning, great place to start, opens up with basically talking about the comic book Watchmen without having to, uh, you know, legally name Watchmen, uh, talking about a comic book story in which uh, this giant squid kind of came crashing down in the city and attacking this world and the fact that that uh, that squid was contributing to the fact that the world would come together at a time of war um, to stop this greater threat and that that would be the thing that would bring peace to this world and it's kind of setting up uh, kind of what happens in comic book uh, stories and stuff but <clears throat> essentially saying that when a giant squid would open up on their world that uh, uh, comic books, uh, quite frankly, are uh, bullcrap, if you will. And uh, because when that would really happen is that nobody would really care and uh, chaos would ensue and you would just build bigger bombs, if you will. So our opening scene is kind of going back to the moment of when this dome is being constructed over uh, Colorado as we see a kind of a strange looking character there um, who's kind of doing some magic, if you will, as he's kind of doing that. But we catch up with our main character, Ellie, who is being separated from her parents. And they're the ones who make the decision of uh, go. This is your chance. You know, things are closing up. You got to get out of here. Save, you know, save your life. Run for yourselves, blah, blah, blah. And uh, she's what I think. I think she's 18 at the time or just about 18. Um, so she's not like a little like five-year-old girl or something that they're trying to tell her to run off by herself. But uh, we see her kind of head towards that dome and kind of break through the the reality, the fabric of reality, as they say, to kind of get in on the outside. So that is the opening scene. Does anyone want to dive in with just kind of catching that whole uh, little, little backstory that we uh, learn about uh, our character Ellie? Yes, Ellie is better at makeup than I am, and I need to practice my foundation game. <laughs> yeah, and uh, that is referring to the fact of them wanting to make their trip out to the camps and the dome. So in order to do that and protect their little girl, Ava, in that one of the opening scenes, we do see um, Ellie, who is applying makeup to Ava, as we see half of it is... Uh, uh, looking more like a, a, a quote-unquote normal human being opposed to being ripped right out of a comic book to kind of help her uh, not draw attention to them. The fact that people are going to be looking for this uh, this little girl. So. But yeah, there's a good line there where uh, Ava kind of questions what cosplay is because uh, Ellie had her uh, cosplay uh, experience with the makeup and everything and uh, She's like, well, it's like Halloween, but more awesome and all the time. I think that's what it says in the dictionary. I I haven't gotten the latest uh, edition for from 2020, so I'm not sure if that was updated in there yet. So. Yep, it it certainly is. Also, the AP style guy is going to put it out in their next one too. So. <laughs> uh, but yeah, any thoughts? Just kind of like opening up with Watchmen and just how they kind of dealt with. Uh, correlating that kind of story with a disaster scenario in our real world i have a very dark thought are we cool with that for a family-friendly podcast bring it on as long as <laughs> you're right. fair, we can get as dark and violent as possible right oh, okay so there is uh in the beginning there's like a background page where there's a bunch of posters that some of the uh, protesters, well, honestly, they're not really protesters. I would say they're violent extremists, but some of those people who are against the comic books have put up and one of them says capes killed Jesus. And I'm like, no, I'm pretty sure that happened a long time ago by very regular, ordinary people. And um, obviously if you are been around long enough you know you have seen real world signs very similar to that and i thought it was interesting particularly when we compare it to watchmen because both books kind of blame their evil on superheroes and i thought it was very interesting um because it's like as humans we're always looking for someone or something else to blame 
And we're so obsessed with making groups of people into being an other or being somehow different and less equal and more marginalized than us. When in the reality is if you cycle the human genome, like between people, racial groups, genders, it's, it is almost entirely identical. It's down to percentage points. Someone better at math can explain it than I can. And I just thought that was very interesting. And well, sad, actually, it's, it's very sad. And we can see parallels to it in our world. And in a funny way, it is very tongue in cheek about the content in this book, because the people in this book are very worried about, well, the stereotype that comics are immature, or they're for kids, or they're, they're too violent, or they're not violent enough. And, and in a way, we have a comic book talking about our real world and how it reflects on comic books. So very interesting, um, a good detail, and and very sad, actually. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, I, was, oh, yep. I was thinking how this kind of uh, has like a throwback to uh, Kingdom Come mm. storyline, where um, there were the superheroes, or actually the super villains were contained under a dome. Um, and they also had a minister who was kind of like their narrator instead of being the instigator in this case, but you know, um, the Reverend McKay and Lauren McKay, and this one's actually, you know, yep. setting things up. So, yeah, and speaking of, speaking of that minister, we cut to the scene where right after that moment where, uh, basically he is, uh, abusing his son and he's, uh, kind of scolding him for you know about him almost killing people in that explosion but uh, ryan is saying that you made me do that that was uh, that was you i never wanted to and he's kind of threatening him and and he he says a very important line about uh um let's see here uh let's see if if you told the feds anything about what goes on here about our plans that is uh looks like it's a little bolded um there is not a power in heaven that will protect you from the wrath that you will inherit. Is that understood? So yeah, there is definitely some kind of extra, extra, something very extra happening with, uh, with this uh, family, with this man here. And uh, any kind of thoughts on maybe his eventual connection behind all of this? I don't know if anybody had any theories or anything. I don't think he's going to be part of a legitimate church for much longer. <laughs> yeah, it's it seems like almost maybe he's going to be like talking to some like, you know, maybe he's in cahoots with some comic book villain of some sort, whether he's like, even though he's, you know, against all that stuff, but maybe he's some in some way uh, answering to it because they told him like he was sent from God or something like that, like. There might be some kind of connection that way, but definitely just the way he said that about our plans. And all I know is that if they make a movie of this, I think John Goodman should play him in the in the movie because uh, that side profile. That's, who he looks there. Like. That's all. <laughs> I've read this three times now, and I, I just keep picturing John Goodman, and uh, I think he could pull it off pretty good. So, um. But yeah, that that causes uh, Ryan to kind of grab his uh, his gun, and it almost looks like he's getting ready to, uh, you know, shoot his dad in a way. But he's kind of distracted by uh, the outside world, and he remembers that you know what he that, that he's going to run away and kind of takes him away from possibly killing his dad there. But it cuts to cuts to a checkpoint. Um, the next scene here, in which. Uh, uh, Ellie and Otto and Ava hiding in the back are all trying to come up with their story and you know they're they're going into this place drawing more attention when everyone's looking for this little girl so Otto's the one that's kind of freaking out but uh, Ellie's pretty much the cool-headed one here just saying oh it'll be fine relax and all that stuff but then she notices Ryan who is uh, walking on the uh, basically hitchhiking out in the rain um, in this lineup of cars and that's when she notices him because she recognizes that was him that had caused you know took away the comic book shop and you know her, her life their life and all that stuff and kind of led them to where they are now um so there's a scene there in which ellie and ryan 
kind of have a dispute. She pushes him down and uh, she's kind of wondering, you know, what the heck he's doing here and what his deal is. And he's just, he's very, he's, he's asking to be left alone, just saying that it wasn't his idea. He didn't mean to do it and he didn't want to hurt anybody. And, and she's about to kind of lend him a hand when uh, they're kind of confronted by the cops here. There is a funny line I wanted to repeat. I couldn't figure out how to work it in to the opening of the show as I select the quote. So I'll just read it here. But a cop comes up and goes on Ellie and Ryan like, hey, what are you two doing here? Uh, we um, and then the boy's like, I had to pee. She's like, yeah, and I was uh, helping him. <laughs> uh, they're just like quickly coming up with an excuse and just when you think they're going to be caught in question we cut to a big action scene with a giant robot showing up um big splash page there uh jeff shaw by the way on the art with d kniff um uh but yeah we see uh, basically some giant monsters and robots as uh you know, our squid, we see some tentacles flying around and some crazy action, um, which leads into uh, a strange character knocking on their window, asking if they've seen this girl. Um, this guy here has a picture of Ava, and uh, this whole scene is him uh, basically creating illusions of this monster and the alien. Um, because as he's going around, he's trying to find this little girl here. Uh, any thoughts on this character who uh, Ava refers to as Dr. Strange, but Ellie demands that's not Dr. Strange, but he looks like him. He, you know, positions his fingers like Dr. Strange does. So any thoughts on this, uh, this character who we will eventually find out in the next scene? I thought he was hilarious. <laughs> I liked him a lot. It's like, Bohemian, Doctor Strange, and Rasputin matched together. I thought that was very funny, very cool. Yeah, um, yeah. I like the fact not wearing real shoes. He's wearing flip flops. Oh, I don't think I noticed that. <laughs> uh, there's a splash page a couple uh, scenes later where he's oh, okay, standing later. on the stairs. <laughs> oh yeah, there. <they're>, okay, <laughs> uh, that's pretty good. And I think um, he's just like a spoof of Doctor Strange until later on. Yeah, uh, we we'll find out more about him. The one moment just to kind of go in with the comedy of it all, uh, uh, as he's trying to get these people to go with him, um, he's creating these illusions, trying to distract everybody, and uh, he uh, shoots out some mystical gas of some sort, I don't know, but he does these pew pew pews, and he's got all these extra hands popping out of everywhere, just going pew pew pew, so, um, and he's actually saying pew pew pew, this isn't the onomatopoeia that is just uh saying that that's what the sound is uh so i do like that he's comedically saying pew 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 four and pew tires are popping <laughs> oh is that what it is okay yeah okay the pop 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 so okay that makes sense but yeah the <laughs> his finger uh, guns actually shoot the tires out <laughs> But yeah, there's a uh, right when that scene is happening, uh, we meet some characters who kind of pull up in a in an unmarked van here. Um, I'll describe it here: is that uh, hey kids, remember the paybacks? Uh, so a good uh, some good lettering there to kind of narration to explain where uh, you know these characters coming up. And he goes, "What? What's that? You don't? Oh yeah, that's right. No one read it, and it got canceled." Well, okay, look, trust me, if you had read it, this scene would have been awesome. As you've seen this like silhouette of them kind of opening up the back of the van. So we meet these characters called the Paybacks, which uh, we'll meet when they do a, a transportation into their lair, to their mansion, to their, uh, you know, uh, their version of what could be the Sanctum Sanctorum, if you will. Um, we meet the Paybacks and the fact that the Paybacks uh, were was a comic book series from Dark Horse Comics. And if you're wondering, okay, is this just some like fake little uh, narration in here or whatever, footnotes, uh, if you do your research, you'll find out that Donnie Cates and Jeff Shaw, who are uh, working on this crossover book, also did the book called The Paybacks, which was a spoof of like superhero comics and such. And uh, I've looked at some of the single issues on eBay because I was kind of curious being like, 
okay, I wonder, you know, with this issue coming out, if that's going to spike the sales of a, a, a short-lived canceled series. And yeah, a lot of those issues are getting pretty pricey out there because everyone's scooping them up. So they do have some trade paperbacks out there and stuff too. So uh, there are more affordable ways. It's probably on Comixology, but uh, anyone, has anyone read the paybacks from Dark Horse Comics from like the last five years? No, I, I thought it was a joke. Okay. Yeah. And it plays pretty well as a joke because even if you didn't like research beyond it, uh, like the first time I read it, I thought the same thing that it was a joke. So I didn't think about it. And then the second time around, I, uh, I really thought I'm like, okay, it says complete edition available now at your local comic shop. Let me just type it in. And sure enough, there was, there's, I think there's a compendium uh, collecting like 14 issues or something and two other individual volumes that they did. But but yeah, it is a series that basically Donny Cates found a way for himself to, you know, maybe get some royalties and sell some old books that, you know, pretty much didn't have a life anymore prior to him becoming the Donny Cates that we know him now with Marvel and his other image series. So, But yeah, these p- payback characters are uh, the names here. We've got Blood Pouch, um, Night Knight. That's knight with an N and knight with a K at the end uh, for the second knight. And uh, the Soviet nunchuck and misadventure. They are the paybacks. So they got a nice, uh, they got some pretty good, like what would seem like great 90s image comics type of, type of names, if you will, even though it was later a Dark Horse comic. But the fact that there was kind of a, a spoof really plays well into the character names and just the design on them. So um any any thoughts on payback to go on with that at all yes so there's a line um that Otto says to the young man whose name i don't know even though i've read this three times Otto Uh, says kyle Uh, ryan i think ryan okay um Otto says i'm sorry who the hell invited you you pyro and that's making me laugh because i like Otto as the every man in this story because uh (laughs) Uh, he's asking the right questions and he's reacting the way I think a real person (laughs) would. Um, uh, So I thought that was funny. And I am excited to see if this uh, person will have some sort of redemption and, and uh, what that will mean. And uh, I like the paybacks They're They're pretty funny. I would, I'd read about them. And actually with you bringing up Otto and Ryan again, that reminded me in the scene right before this, when they're out in the street, um, uh, Otto mentions Ellie and Ryan jumps in and goes, wait, your name is, and then he's cut off by Ellie's conversation, but we never come back to it. Um, when Ryan got that gun and talked with the government, um, do we recall if like, if her name was mentioned at all? Cause he's very, he recognizes the name, but this is the first time he has heard it and kind of associated. He's like, wait, so your name is, So he already has some sort of, and we don't know much about Ellie beyond what I said in the opening there. So it seems like there's some sort of, and maybe that's why she keeps to a domino mask, or maybe there's some weird connection with the, you know, we we heard in that first issue that I think they were going to be a couple and have this epic romance. They said, oh, but that's not happening yet. But this is just a little ingredient that kind of was intriguing good idea so yeah um, so there might be something developing there so um as we're in uh, we'll just call it the sanctum sanctorum um or the sanctum sanctorum just to, for legal reasons you know and, uh in the scene ellie has that that sketch of the you know supposedly of the superman sketch and saying like well we're here we're trying to get to the camps get inside the dome you know, my parents in there trying to find her parents, all of this stuff that's going on. And the paybacks were like, hey, we were just in charge of uh, getting the girl and we're here. We're going to get you guys safe and go out. But, you know, we're not dealing with all that, you know, dome stuff. And, and, uh, but she's like, well, here, this person, we're looking for this person. And uh, so Ellie holds it up and uh, um, let's see here. She's like, hey, wait, is he here? He's like, is, is this him? Can I talk to him? Please, just... And then uh, an off-word off, off word balloon, uh, off-panel word balloons 
just said, oh, it's okay, it's okay. Hey, is that a drawing of me? And Ellie's like, oh my God. And she's kind of, kind of, you know, starstruck in a way. And she's holding up that, that supposedly Superman drawing and the word balloon. We even see a little, uh, little hair. Uh, here's the resident Superman fan here. Uh, what's that? Is the, what's spit the curl. term? Yeah, the spit curl. Thank you. We even see the little uh, spit curl um, in the, the silhouette and the shadows there. And he goes, hey, would you look at that? That's just swell. You know, he kind of sounds, you know, he's got that, you know, Superman type of dialogue. But no, instead, it is none other than Frank Einstein, madman himself, which uh, <laughs> I think you can all imagine, you know, maybe my reaction to, to this. Um, I would like to hear everyone else, uh, Jim and Katie, on this this lead up to the Superman character we're looking for, and we get Frank Einstein, Madman, who we just recently saw in uh, a comic book called X-Ray Robot, which uh, if I didn't mention last week, it is now available in trade paperback form. So there it is. Uh, issues three, one, four, and two are all in there, but in the correct order. Okay, uh, Jim, any thoughts on uh, Madman showing up instead of Superman? Well, I thought that was funny because, um, yeah, we were expecting Superman and you see this other guy and um, that symbol that she d does drew, everybody thinks is an ass, but yes, it could be that it's, lightning question mark, you know, thingy, whatever it's call called. It the exclamation bolt. Exclamation bolt. Okay. I've never read Madman except for that b little bit he showed up in uh x-ray robot that's all i've ever seen of him so um, but yeah i thought that was fun to, to see just turn everything around and then see a real character from other comics appear in this book you know yeah yeah it's not you know it's not a fake dr strange or something you know and uh um, until you know when i first read this i did not know that the paybacks actually existed until i did some checking later on so yeah, and this would be the first, you know, you. very popular character outside of, uh, you know, the the unknowns there. Um, Katie, uh, reaction to Madman? Oh yes. So right before I flipped to the next page in Kindle, I was like, OMG, are they are they gonna do it? Are they gonna show Superman? And then I flipped to the next page and I'm like, oh, oh my goodness! I was so excited. And the first thing I did was I took a screenshot and I was gonna send it to you, but I thought it would be really corny, so I figured I'll save it for the podcast where corny is our middle name. Uh, I was <laughs> so surprised and so excited, and that was unexpected, but very cool. And I'm excited to see what comes next. That yeah, Madman is in a comic that is not a Madman comic. This is going to be very cool. I really admire the writer's commitment to doing a crossover. That's very nice. Yeah. Um, and it was just a good surprise, a good twist, and I really liked it. So and I'm very happy with it. As Madman uh, was, uh, he was tolling off there, but his final line, which I didn't say was, Never really been much for capes, though, as he's commenting on the fact that the drawing has a cape, but uh, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, uh, oh, yeah, the, the madman of it all. So Mike Allred had tweeted out, he goes, might be somewhat of a spoiler, but, uh, um, but he posted uh, what we'll eventually see when we turn a couple pages, which is a whole spread of... Uh, Mike Allred's work. So within Oh my goodness. Book, yeah, so you don't see this in the digital copy, I don't believe. No. You do not. Yeah, so it says Love Madman, get more Mike Allred. Check out these fantastic reads and go to triple pop.com. That's a a a pop.com for more. That is his website for all of his uh his creations. And it's kind of cool. It's so updated that, you know, right in the middle we have X-ray robot which um, if I didn't mention yet, is available in trade paperback form uh, from your local comic shop and Amazon and retailers and all that stuff. Um, so he had tweeted that out and I was like, okay, because we had Brian K. Vaughn get opened up in, in the issue two and he got murdered and there's <laughs> other comic creators that had gone missing. When I saw Mike Allred's tweet, my brain went to, oh, he's appearing as himself, like in a newscast or he's another one that got axed in the story. 
So I got super excited just being like, okay, I can't wait two weeks for Midtown shipment. I'm going to buy it. I bought it on Comixology. I read it right there. And I'm going around. I'm thinking, okay, Mike's going to show up as himself in the book somewhere. And it wasn't happening. So in that moment, I still... I was still in the moment of just like, I don't know what's happening here. And Madman showing up at the end was just a, like we've reacted. It was a, a pretty great surprise. So, um, And then the, the, the mistaken yeah. identity with the drawing kind of fits with the girls calling uh, the character that was, looks like Dr. Strange, Dr. Strange. Oh, his yeah. Is actually Dr. Black. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Black with a Q. Yes. <laughs> um that yeah yeah funny. yeah that's definitely yeah i didn't notice that um yeah in issue four um there is a cover b which uh is available for order now they help without withheld it to hold the spoiler of madman but uh uh cover b is available i already got uh mine and kirby's copy uh pre-ordered to get the all red cover b but that cover and it's a split cover right now, and half of it is covered up because there is going to be another mystery guest cameo that will re will be revealed on the day issue four comes out. So if you are reading that and don't want to be spoiled on that, A, avoid cover B to look at it. Uh, also, you know, it's probably going to be in all the headlines and pictures. So that'll be something that I'll be uh, reading right away. I'll just have to. Should we start uh, a pool on who it's going to be? It's gonna be funny when it's Superman. It will be. <laughs> that would that be would funny. Be Howard the Duck. See, Superman and Madman have teamed up before in the Superman Madman Hullabaloo special. Oh. Uh, available now in trade paperback. Um, I don't have my example here. Um, but uh, with all of this, this arc is called Kids Love Chains, which goes back to that opening quote when we had that very philosophical quote of. Uh, uh, I forget who, who had said it, but then there was one that said, kids love chains, Todd McFarlane. And with this being Image, you know, Madman has been in Image Comics before too. He kind of jumped between indie publishers and stuff. Um, he's basically like The Office and Friends where they jump between streaming services. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm wondering if Spawn's going to be showing up. Ooh, Ooh. that'd be cool. Like, this arc is named after a Todd McFarlane quote. And you know, if you're looking at one of the big image characters, um, either Spawn or like Rick Grimes or somebody, I don't know. Savage Dragon. Ooh. Savage Dragon, yeah. That would, which, by the way, Madman has been in Savage Dragon <laughs> as well. So it, it's, it gets me so excited for this book. <laughs> I admire the All Reds dedication to putting Madman in everything. That is fantastic. I love yeah. that. Yeah, Mike is, uh, he's, he's never, uh, he has no shame, I think, and he would definitely uh, second that um, when it comes to self-promotion and, you know, stuff like that. So much like uh, myself and X-Ray Robot number, oh, wait. So yeah, that is the issue. Any closing thoughts on the overall issue? It's got me hooked for a few more issues anyway. Katie? Yeah, I'm glad we are picking it out and doing it as a club pick because I don't know if I would have picked it up on my own, but so far it's been very fun and very valuable. So I'm, I'm having a good time. Oh, and BTW, that splash page with the Transformer Gundam fighting the squid was awesome. That was great. More <laughs> of that, please. Yeah, great art there by Jeff Shaw and uh, D. Kniff, if I'm pronouncing that right. Um, but yeah, excellent book. I'm loving it. And I am uh, once issue this next one comes out, I, I think I'll be able to get that one on the the, the week it comes out rather than waiting in the mail otherwise i'd be buying it digitally because that's how much i love the series where i'm like i have to I, I can't go on the internet without having read it so well i right. for one thought this was you know probably like the most exciting issue so far <laughs> yes uh yeah you've uh, you had it all told to you there so it's uh but yeah um we will uh, return next month for uh, issue number four for upcoming uh, upcoming club discussions, we're going to have uh, 
Um, Batman, the adventures continue issue number eight, the finale. Now I wasn't getting that one. So we'll have to hear from the other people uh, when they're ready to talk about it. I think it just came out this past week in print form came out probably a while back in the digital chapter. So we will talk about that within the next week or two. And then uh, ink blot number, uh, actually I think ink blots on, Oh yeah. Number six will be out in February before their, uh, their art break. All right, that will do it for uh, the club discussion. Let's move on to the weekly reviews. All right. All red and all right. Okay, and then David, we're going to have you start first just to, uh, looks like we'll probably make some good time, but we have a decent, decent stack. So I'll just kind of monitor the time and if I need to, throw your last one in uh, earlier, then I'll just cut over to you, so. Okay. Okay, and Jim's towards the end, so he will return when he does here. Okay, we are recording audio. There we go. <clears throat> Welcome to the weekly review section. We're gonna go all the way around the internet, talk about the books that we've been reading, both new and old. This week, we're gonna kick it off with David. What you got? All right, well, continuing my read of the Amalgam comics, um, I've got here uh, the, the first sort of continuation or sequel type issue, since these are all just number ones that don't really go anywhere. Um, there were a few that they did a different book, a different title, new number one, but kind of sort of continued. In this case, it's more of a prequel. It's uh, Super Soldier, Man of War, number one. And this actually takes place in like World War II era, um, which uh, the, the story with this character is kind of a merging you know, of uh, Captain America and Superman, whereas the uh, rocket had crashed in Smallville in 1938, but there were no survivors. They used the, uh, what, uh, um, samples they could of uh, you know genetic material that was left in the ship to add to this uh, super soldier serum that they gave to this you know puny little soldier guy and turned him into the super soldier um, so this is you know one of his adventures uh, in, in world war ii um, and his sidekick, rather than Bucky, he's actually got Jimmy Olsen that follows him around and takes pictures. Um, and uh, right off, they start with instead of having like the All Star Squadron or something like that, they they combine them and they have the uh, the All Star Winners Squadron <laughs> meeting at the Midtown Clubhouse. And then you can look through and try to make out some of the characters that they have. Um, I can't remember uh, what they were calling him Aqua Mariner, I think is the name. Of the <laughs> and he was one of the, uh, the um, characters from the first JLX uh, book that I read. Um, so he makes a, a brief appearance in here as one of the all-star winner squad. Yeah, Aqua Mariner sounds a lot better than Subman. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Subman. Uh, I just see a guy with uh, a beer belly and a big hoagie sandwich. <laughs> yeah, it's probably on like a cover of Mad Magazine somewhere. Um, yep. Oh, yeah. Aquamariner. They've got the name right here. Um, they've got some of the, the other names in here. There's a Brooklyn Barnes. Um, Let's see some of the the other ones. Um, I, I think instead of uh, the wizard, it, it might still be the wizard, but they call him Wiz for short in here, which almost looks like he's also combined with probably the Golden Age Flash. Um, and then they've they've combined the original um, Human Torch with the original Green Lantern, and they have the Human Lantern, who's. Um, who's made a cake that everybody seems pretty hesitant on eating. <laughs> so um, so it's, it kind of starts off there. And then 
um, he gets, he tells them that he's actually, he's got to fly off. He's got a secret mission that he, he can't tell them about because it's a secret mission. And he goes overseas and we find that uh, um, Lois Lane has married Lex Luthor. Um, and of course, Clark Kent is still pretty heartbroken by that. But uh, life goes on. Um, we, we are also introduced in here to Sergeant Rock and his Howlin' Commandos. Um, <laughs> ah, which is yes. funny because that takes us back to a, a real life joke from the old comic book store with our, uh, um, actually, I believe that was the original owner that said that, right? Anthony, is yep. that, was was Mike? Okay. Yeah. So the guys, the, the, uh, the guys downstairs, one of them would come up and talk about some of those old war comics and stuff like that. So we got uh, Sergeant Rock and his Howling Commandos, um, and uh, they get into you know, brawl with some other soldiers, and um, you know, he's got to secretly use the super breath to uh, break up the fight. So it's it's very World War II story um, feeling too. Um, they they really got a lot of that in there. So a lot of these books have done a pretty good job of um, of, of having the feel that they were trying to go for. Um, this one, like like the other Super Soldier book, uh, was written. I think there was more writing duties actually given to Dave Gibbons this time. So not just the art. Um, but Dauntless Dave Gibbons did the co-plot uh, with the script and pencils, and uh, Mark Wade did the co-plot rather than co-writing on this one. Um, otherwise, it's a very similar creative team to the Super Soldier book. Um, so I think Dave Gibbons' artwork really uh, works works very well for a comic um, in this this setting and this feel to it and everything. Um, it it looks and feels exactly what you would expect something like this to be. Um, we, uh, we go through the story, basically, you got to save the world. You got this Baron Zemo character. I'm trying to remember what they actually call him, who's teamed up with Lex Luthor. Um, there's hints about the, um, some of the weapons and things that were talked about in Super Soldier. Um, so even though this one's coming out first, it is like a prequel that's mentioning, you could very easily read this first and then read Super Soldier number one. And, you know, it would it'd flow together and you're like, oh yeah, they talked about that. But uh, I was not disappointed in this. Um, it was everything that you would expect it to be for a mashup of Captain America and Superman. So in uh, Super Soldier Man of War number one. Cool, cool. All right, we will jump over to Kirby for the next book. What you got for us? Um, yeah, Cinderella's annual bloody Christmas. <laughs> See if it's got it's got her slaughtering a snowman on the cover there. They had a few different covers I to choose from, of course, as they always do. Have you missed her? She missed you. Cinderella is back and is making a list and uh, planning to kill everyone on it twice. In this issue, don't miss the return of the grim universe's most insane or societally different resident as she takes on Krampus in the North Pole. Oh, and holiday cheer, somehow, don't eat the red snow this winter. It's fun because it starts out a little, uh, What's her name? Little Lou Who, or whatever. Yeah, Doctor Seuss. Uh... Grinch. Little Lucy. Lucy. Yeah, and it. The next page goes the whole different scene, and they keep jumping around, and they keep playing with all different types of. Almost all the big Christmas, uh, stories throughout here. And then you got Krampus with all his little minions, and they all got like all these mouse on their bodies and when they attack people, they just devour them. But, uh, yeah, it's, I mean, they go into Christmas vacation, uh, peanuts. 
uh, <laughs> a Christmas story. Peanuts is in here. Uh, yeah, a <laughs> little. <laughs> but it's just fun how they just keep jumping from scene to scene, where they go through all these different uh, Christmas stories. And there's even a game playing page in here that jumps through a ton of different Christmas. I can't find it now. I just showed it. Oh, okay. Where they go through a bunch of different Christmas stories and stuff in there. But but yeah, this was a really fun. I didn't know Cinderella was evil. I thought she'd be a good character too, because I haven't read all of them like Belle from Beauty and the Beast and stuff. I haven't read hers either. So I was kind of surprised to see that she's more evil at heart, but it was a fun story. It could have been a little bit better written. It wasn't written as well as the other Christmas ones from uh, this whole run that I've been reviewing so far, the Van Helsing and all them. But yeah, if you like Christmas stories and you like good variety, this is Definitely enjoyable. Brings you back. Gets you just brings you back to all your Christmas favorites from your over the years. But I don't want to spoil everything since Damon hasn't read it or but, but yeah, it was a fun story. So check that out. And good. From Grim Fairy all right, Tale. It's time, I remember. <laughs> it's time to go to a galaxy far, far away and check in with our Jedi Ambassador Katie. What you got? Uh, Thank you so much. This week, I have a book that I've been looking forward to for about a year now. It is Star Wars Adventures, The Clone Wars Battle Tales. It is written by Michael Morisi, and the artists are Derek Charm, Ariana Florian, Mario Del Peninio, Megan Levins, Valentina Pinto, David Tinto, and Philip Murphy. All right. So uh, the premise of this book, uh, it is from IDW, by the way premise of this book is a bunch of stories set during the Clone Wars cartoon. Um, So we see characters like Obi-Wan Kenobi, a little bit of Anakin, uh, Jedi General Plo Koon, and Captain Rex, Commander Cody, and Commander Wolf, all of whom are clones. Um, This uh, tells five Clone Wars missions, so five different stories that are, are all connected by kind of a subplot where uh, the clones are are fighting these battles and they're recounting previous battle tales to one another. Um, I loved this book and not just because I was hyped for it. Um, Every story was very well written. I could imagine the voice actors saying these lines. They felt very much like episodes from the early seasons of the Clone Wars cartoon. So that was very fun. Um, And they were just a solid read. I... I'm like, well, is this going to be like very little kid ish? No, it wasn't. I think it was accessible for kids. Like I would totally give this to a 10 year old, but enjoyable by everyone. Um, And I'd actually say that about the Clone Wars series as well. So um, I loved getting to see more of Commander Wolf and the Wolf Pack. So if you're a big fan of that character, wish there was more. Oh, you should go pick up this book. Um, What else was cool? There was a story with Obi-Wan that I really liked where he goes to a planet covered in ice and snow, not Hoth, and effectively helps out, like, they have a real name, but I'm going to call them Snow Ewoks, uh, helps them while still thwarting General Grievous. General Grievous um, has taken Obi-Wan prisoner and his battalion of clones, and he wants them to build a bridge, and Obi-Wan's like, I'm not building a bridge. I am not doing anything to help the Confederates win, you evil, terrible monster, General Grievous. But then they find out these little snow Ewoks actually really need the bridge to survive, and they were separated from their family group. So they decide they're going to rebuild this little ice bridge, and then to keep it out of General Grievous's hands, they're going to blow it up once all the little critters are back together. Um, what else was cool there? Uh, Padme made an appearance and Clone Wars fans will tell you that Padme is way better in that series than she is in the movies. So that was very cool trying to see them solve some problems with diplomacy. And um, I really liked it. <laughs> uh, I don't want to spoil all the stories because you should go read it. It is worth your money. It is worth your time. I know not all of the Star Wars stories or adventures are. Uh, this is a ton of fun. 
definitely go read this. The hype pays off. Um, the only, uh, not really a downside, but you should know that Ahsoka is not in here. So if you're a big Ahsoka fan like I am, she is actually not in these stories. Uh, apparently they take place before she joins the squad. So yeah, that is my review of Star Wars Adventures, The Clone Wars Battle Tales from IDW Comics. Excellent. All right. Jim, what you got for us this week? I was inspired by our club pick, Batman, The Adventure Continues. So that when I saw this uh, being offered, I had to get it. And it is Batman Adventures, Robin the Boy Wonder. And this is six stories that were originally published in the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, in the Batman Adventures books. Um, and they all focus, as the title would suggest, upon Robin, who, in, of course, in this incarnation is Tim Drake. Um, and although they don't make much of a deal about who the secret identity is, except you know it's not um, Dick Grayson because Nightwing is also a character here. Um, and if you've been following us with our reading of The Adventure Continues, we know that uh, Jason Todd first made his appearance in that series with our reading of that. So uh, apparently it's going to have to be Tim Drake. But um, this, is, this is fun. It's just, like I said, six issues of uh, focusing on uh, Robin, um, either on his own or with the back, our back girl and Nightwing, or just having um, some scenes with Batman where they're one on one and Batman gets to teach him something. Um, my favorite story was one where um, Robin's out with uh, back, back girl and Nightwing, and he's like, Boy, I wish I was around in the old days when you had all these just weird costume creeps instead of these gun-toting psychopaths. You know, something, you know, like just the weird weirdos who have these weird costumes, you know. And they're like, what are you talking about? We got that. And it's like, yeah, you night we have, you know, Two-Face and Joker, but I'm just thinking the weird ones that don't are pretty much harmless and whatever, so... Night, uh, Batgirl and Nightwing take turns and put on alternate costumes and try to present themselves as these weird villains that Robin wants to fight. But he's too smart for them and he's able to detect that they were themselves even though they were dressed completely different. So he goes off, you know, he thanks for trying anyway, but he goes off his own, own way. And he sees this kid dressed as a flower breaking into a shop. And it's like he ends up stopping him. And in the course of that, he talks to the kid instead of just beating him up and finds out that he's a high school kid who needs some direction and help. And he, he ends up giving it to him. And they go back to the, they all end up back at the bad cave and they're talking about you know, that was a good thing you did there and everything, you know, yeah. And then after he goes off to bed, Alfred just kind of subtly reveals that no, or Batman, it says, Alfred, thank you for your help with that. And then Nightwing and Batgirl look at him, what, that was you? And, you know, it just was really cute that Alfred, the older butler, could pay, pay pass off as a teenager in a costume <laughs> and fool Tim and Robin when Batgirl and Nightwing couldn't. Yeah, I heard that Alfred was going to be uh, originally cast for the Benjamin Button movie, but they just went with a more famous person. So. <laughs> Um, there was a bit of delay. Your audio came through good, but some of the video. So I'm I'm not sure if you've finished yet. I am. Okay. So yeah, the the video is delayed just a tad on my side at least, but just wanted to make sure. Okay. Um, my title here is going to be uh, the Avengers issue number forty one. Um, let me switch my window here in just a second. Issue number forty one. Uh, 
the infamous firebird of cosmic destruction and rebirth known as the Phoenix Force has returned to Earth to find a new avatar. So now the Avengers and some of the most powerful heroes and villains in the Marvel Universe are being called into a competition unlike anything they've ever seen. A globe-spanning battle that will transform them all and ultimately decide who will be the all-new Phoenix. This is from the current Enter the Phoenix uh, arc over at the Avengers. It started in issue number 40 um, with the last one. This here is just the uh, special Alien versus cover month that uh, Marvel did in January. So this is Black Panther versus Alien, which I thought was a pretty sweet cover there. So I scooped up that one. Uh, Damon, this will be for sale to you for $800 if you'd like. Um, bag and board is extra though. Um, this here, uh, I wanted to talk about this issue so I can talk more about what happened with the last one as well. But basically, uh, the Phoenix Force is here and basically it's looking for a new host. And rather than just uh, consuming somebody and just having it, that be that, um, it decided to hold this global uh, competition. And uh, this is something that after reading it, I am so surprised that this is actually just self-contained within single issues of the Avengers because it could have been very easily been, you know, their summer event or something, spring to summer event, uh, because you get a lot of uh, one page uh, uh, face offs here, some challenges that could have very easily just been like one shots. Um, for instance, in issue number 40, uh, the majority of the issue was Captain America versus Dr. Doom. Uh, everyone's basically against their will where they're forced, they're all kind of relocated they're all in this uh i think it's the i forget what it's like the white room but it's like got one extra word in there it's like the white room of death or white dark room or something i don't know there's something but they're all like trapped in this uh limbo where they're just waiting to be called randomly and uh so in this particular issue it's just an action pack of like mostly one page battles but it does kick off with the black panther um it's kind of funny. He's talking about how uh, um, Steve Rogers impatiently punches the scenery. Thor laughs to the hide. Uh, Lord, hold on. Thor laughs to hide his brooding. Carol broods to hide her laughter. Tony armors his fragile ego one egotistical word at a time. But what Black Panther does, he goes to that world where he, uh, with the ancestors of the Black Panthers and sits there and basically meditates and prays and it just kind of shows the, like how he deals with kind of you know situations rather than going around and punching things or drinking and things like that um, his match which is a couple pages here is Black Panther versus and uh, might, I may call him the giant size man thing because it is a, a, a very large man thing, which is funny because Luke Cage later in the issue, uh, when they're referring to it, um, Luke goes, oh yeah, and uh, the king's back uh, and he was fighting the man. Th he goes, ain't saying that name, the other guy. <laughs> so Luke Cage doesn't even want to say man thing. So that was a funny little moment there, but they are caught in this limbo after each battle as they're all just, you know, it's not a battle to the death or anything. And it's like a knockout type of battle. And, and it's basically everyone just kind of competing, kind of just wondering where they're going to be thrown next. And there's some inner fighting within in limbo here um, between the characters, which has nothing to do with the actual challenges because they'll just be blipped out of there, if you will, and uh, thrown in to another scenario. So they go to the Himalayas and, uh, and that's where Luke Cage fights uh, the American Eagle character. Then we have another battle in which uh, uh, Shanna, the She-Devil, uh, fights. is basically pit against the, like, 10-year-old girl, uh, Lunella Lafayette, Moon Girl. Um, but she's like, yeah, I'm not fighting, a, a punching a little girl. But I have nothing against punching a giant dinosaur. So uh, she goes up against Devil Dinosaur in this fight that lasts one page within this comic once again if that was a single issue book you know to spread out a fight over 20 pages would have been a pretty entertaining idea but uh they all just do it page by page uh jane foster the valkyrie current valkyrie is fighting um the uh what's his name the the giant all eyeball guy um orb the orb who's just that man with the giant eyeball on top of his body um 
Then we have the Hyperion, who is fighting against Shang-Chi. We've got uh, the Red Widow, who is going against a certain character that a couple people around here adore, Howard the Duck. Yes, Howard the Duck has a one-page appearance in this fight against the Red Widow. I will not review the second half of that page to reveal in that uh, Jacob's Birthday Battle-esque type of matchup uh, who would win between the Red Widow and Howard the Duck. Uh, and by the way, they each member, each character is infused with the Phoenix Force. So it's not just them, you know, Howard fighting somebody else with their individual powers. It is uh, them with heightened powers of the Phoenix Force. Uh, but yeah, it, it's crazy. It's fun. And uh, it cycles back to Black Panther a little more. It is more of a Black Panther centric issue. Um, but once again, we're just kind of left on a page of just like, Here's the next bout into the next issue. I'm not sure how long this is running. Traditionally, I'll probably do a six issue run for a trade paperback. But uh, yeah, the Enter the Phoenix. Uh, uh, Enter the Phoenix is the story arc. This is part two, starting with issue number 40, and then this one, which is issue number 41. So it's a fun, crazy story. That, uh, but if you're looking for these long, epic battles, it's all just self-contained and mostly one pages. But it's just a lot of fun, just kind of seeing what's going on here so but yep i'm enjoying that and that was issues or avengers issue number 41 all right uh david okay well speaking of the phoenix and phoenix powers um uh, there's kind of related to uh jlx unleashed number one mm. this is another kind of follow-up so they had uh, jlx number one and they follow it up with this. Uh, what's interesting is if you go to the letters pages, you don't want to read it first because there's some spoilers for the issue, but um, it is kind of uh, fun and I want to mention it before I forget that there's some things talked about in the, the letters page about these fake letters that um, kind of fills in a few of the gaps between the first series and this one. Um, <clears throat> And it starts off by saying, welcome back to the second incarnation of the JLX. Like a phoenix, the band of metamutant outcasts have made their way back. Since the end of their previous title, the letters have been pouring in. We didn't realize how many fans we had. Originally, a limited series spinoff of the Judgment League Avengers, JLX wasn't supposed to be around longer than 12 issues. Here are some of the letters responsible for the comeback of the year. And it goes in to talk about letters, you know, where these fake fans have written in and it comments about some of the things that happened in a particular story that never actually was printed. Um, for example, one person writes a list of their, their famous things that, that happen of it, like the love triangle of Night Creeper, Kokoro, and Angel Hawk. Uh, Sunfire Storm's new costume. Kitty Sandsmark becoming Wonder Cat. Uh, let's see. The appearance of JLA's blue jacket and Wonder Gold needing help to repair Red Vision. Uh, JLX trouncing the extremists. Um, and it goes on in some of several of these other letters mentioned things that weren't actually in books, but uh, it fills in the background. And so reading this issue um, after having read the regular JLX number one feels a lot like just having read two random issues of, of a comic book series. Like you're reading this one and you know that they touch on things that happened all the way back in the, in the last one, but there's all, also a lot of things that have happened in between. Um, and it's written a way that you're supposed to kind of like wonder about what happened and things like that. And again, some of those things have uh, details revealed in the fake letters page. Um, so in this one, we have a lot of the same characters returning. Uh, we find that there has, in fact, they've won out. There's uh, it, we're, meta mutant kind has lost. They've been outlawed, so they're all locked up. And you've got characters like Mr. X, who is an example of a character who wasn't just two characters merged together, but like four or five of them. He's a mixture of uh, Professor X, uh, Martian Manhunter, uh, Bishop, 
and a scroll. Uh, there might be something else mixed in there just for good measure. So he's kind of all those things. And he's John Jones or Mr. X. Um, and you've got uh, old characters. Some of the characters from the first issue, you know, you, you find out in here were killed off in kind of this big battle um, that they had that kind of kicked off in, in the last issue or the, the first number one. Um, and they, they recap, you know, a little bit of it and you find out a few things. Um, you find out one of the characters that was a, uh, a mixture of Jean Grey and Fire from like the Justice League and stuff um, was called Firebird. And now she's, be, she's turned into a villain known as the Dark Firebird. Um, so the uh, Storm character, who's also the Wonder Woman character, um, has, has gone to basically ask Mr. X to get the JLX back together. She'll free him from prison and they have to go over and basically save the world from Fin Fang Flame, who has been released by, um, trying to think of the name that they gave them, but uh, it's the, uh, the Hellfire League of Injustice has released Fin Fan Flame, Fin Fang Flame. Uh, and it's kicking everybody's butts and nobody can stop up. So, um, they're released from prison, they go after they have the big battle, and in one issue, it's, you know, kind of, they've come back, they've defeated the villain, and now they're, they're out and they're freed, and, you know, to find out what happens once this all happens, I guess you would continue reading the book, except, as far as I know, there, there is nothing else past this, so, but it is, uh, it is interesting, you know, because it's easy to go through a letters page that you know is a fake letters page anyways and ignore it and pass over it. But there is a lot of things in there that kind of explain some of the things. And even, even other books, um, because when I reviewed um, the, uh, I think I've got it right here, or not, um, Speed Demon, yes. And there's, uh, you, you're wondering who this other demon was that somebody was bonded to and here was a question that was raised in this you actually get an answer in the letters page from jlx unleashed so you don't want to skip over the extras in books like this because it really is it's part of the story it's part of the whole fun of of the thing but uh so there we have it and um i know some of these i've been mentioning who published it this one was another dc comics published book Cool. All right, uh, Kirby, what you got next? All right, I was really looking forward to this one, and it was as enjoyable as I expected. But it's Gut Ghost and Stabity Bunny one shot. Throughout this, the Gut Ghost is just trying to watch TV. Finds out his favorite show is on. They're doing a marathon about it, and something happens where. A creature fighting with Stabity Bunny from another realm ends up getting coming out of the TV. The creature's like a squirrel that got merged with an octopus. <laughs> but they fight, they come out of the TV, destroy the TV. I well actually the TV doesn't get destroyed until one of the character well the squirrel octopus character goes back into the TV to destroy to, so he can come back and destroy our world in the future. But when he goes in there, he blows up the whole TV. So Gut goes, explains to Stabity Bunny that you owe me a TV. So, and Stabity Bunny doesn't speak. So they're sitting there trying to get words through to each other and thoughts and they end up making a bunch of deals, go through, and they find some contests that they can enter and stuff to win TVs. They buy, do some stuff because Stabity Bunny can make things appear, and they do that to try to get a TV and stuff. But I don't want to ruin all that for you, so you're going to have to read it yourself. But this is definitely worth the pickup. It was a lot of fun. Uh, it's just everything with Stabity Bunny so far has been great. 
and this is my first introduction to the gut ghost but yeah <laughs> yeah if you want some comedy in your life check it out <laughs> yeah that, that would be another one that i would think that you know you made up but i have heard of stabity bunny because kurt's friend um jared that was like one of his staples that he always got uh stabity bunny so so I knew yeah. about that, but gut goes, that was, that's completely new to me. So <laughs> yeah, same here. I I recognize Stabity Bunny. I, I don't think I've seen anything come through or any, that anybody was uh reading any gut ghost. No, I did one Stabity Bunny review in the past not long ago, and that was my first introduction to him. But yeah. <laughs> He's gonna keep showing up in my stuff. <laughs> All right. Um, we are going to jump back to David to make sure we get his uh, last book in there before he ha has to make a uh, departure. So, David, what's your next uh, thing that you got to talk about? Yes, it is. A, it is kind of a thing that I'm talking about. Um, and I can mention it because it's not quite a man thing. It's actually a bat thing. Um, so we here we have another uh, amalgam book. Uh, this time being kind of a mixture of um, man bat and man thing. Um, I, I was looking to see if there was a little swamp thing thrown in there. And it is possible because um, man thing and, and swamp, swamp thing, did I say that right? Swamp thing. Um, you know, they're, they're very similar in a lot of ways and yet different in others. Um, but uh, it's, they, they make it clear, it's not real obvious if there's a swamp thing thrown into it or not, but um, based on character names and stuff like that, you know that it is a uh, man thing with man bad. And this has a, a feel like one of those books or even like a swamp thing type feel to it. It's a little darker, a little grittier. So, you know, maybe even like a Batman book to it. And it's got a lot of Batman like characters like Bullock and um so uh um you know they're in uh i think it's in new gotham there's a lot of stories done in in, in new gotham you know and you get the, the dark feel the police are involved there's uh been an attack you know and bullock right away suspects even before the big the big shadow lurks over them that this is the uh the bat thing at work here that's you know attacked disfigured and killed um a, a criminal um, so as as you go through the story um it there's there's some changing going on there's definitely some development uh where where bullock is like um he's uh He's, he's out to get the bad thing. He thinks that this is just a creature that it's on the loose, it's dangerous, it's killing people and things like that. But um, ever since he came on the scene, uh, Bullock's actually been protecting um, Bat Thing's former family. Um, he goes, checks in on him and stuff like this. And you realize through the story that um, after all this time, it's not that uh, the, the bad thing has been following Bullock and trying to kill him and stuff like that. He's actually been following and trying to protect him because Bullock is trying to protect his family. Um, so that's the story and it all kind of un unravels and you find out more of the characters and um, what uh, what happened and why. And you have his, his wife who dreams that he returns only to uh, turn back into the bat thing and she wakes up screaming and wakes the daughter. And this is a, a nightly thing ever since daddy turned into the bat thing. Um, so it's, uh, I, I gotta say it wouldn't normally be one of the books that would be more my style, but I could definitely see Anthony uh, really enjoying a book like this. Doesn't quite have the swamp aspects of it. Although, you know, it is mentioned how uh, bat thing lives out in the swamps and, and he returns to the city to basically do his hunting and, and things like that. Uh, but you, you never see too much of the, um, the swamp parts of it. Everything happens in the city and you experience, you know, everything in, in town as you 
find that these these people are, are trying to kill bat things family off and um it's, it's just this big cycle of of revenge and protection uh for these very char various characters in here yeah, um in books they like to uh censor it so you don't see all the swamp parts yeah and this book um is published by dc and it does feel um like that. Sometimes I have to check, and other times some of these books, you can kind of tell the way that they're written and everything, that they feel more like one publisher or another. And in this case, it does feel like something a little bit more uh, DC in a style that they would do a Swamp Thing book or a Batman book or something like that. Um, but yeah, if you're if you're a fan of any of those uh, kind of a little bit darker, grittier stories with some monster stuff thrown into it, and whatever, uh, Bat Thing would be a good amalgam comic for you to check out. Yeah, I'm definitely going to check that one out. Cool, cool. All right. Uh, Jim, you want to pick us up where we left off there? All right. Um, the book I got right now is called The Seeds. And this is written by Ann Lucenti and art by David Aha. And here's the cover. This is a graphic novel uh, that is a dystopian, very near future um, setting in which uh, there's a technology that's pretty much much like ours, but there's, there's a very large group of people that have separated them, themselves from the rest of us by building a wall or being pushed outside of a wall where they completely reject technology pretty much completely. Um, and then there, over all this, there is all the things that we are dealing with or have been dealing with as far as disease and uh, the environmental impact things that are going on and such. And then on top of all that, there are aliens on earth. And the aliens are there to collect samples. They want to collect seeds. They want to collect, you know, DNA and whatever. And for them, it's valuable only if the earth ends up dying. If the earth continues to live, these samples aren't worth anything. But they have to make sure that the earth is around long enough for them to connect, collect samples to make a viable go of it. So they're getting involved with human affairs while they're doing this. Um, it's a real interesting story where there are two women. Uh, one is a journalist on the tech side and the other one is a uh, woman who falls in love with an alien and moves to the non-tech side. And the journalist finds out about the relationship that the other woman is having with an alien and is putting her publisher is gave, putting pressure on her to reveal this and make it public. So just to pr promote sales and um, how all these things work together to affect or how these, all these things affect what um, is going on with the rest of the world is really interesting. Um, I'm not going to reveal how it turns out, but, one of the major main things is indicated by what's on the cover there. Oh, see, I thought that was just something that, you know, was just stuck to it that I was going to warn you not to get stung or something. So. Yeah. So if you know what's one of the impact, the environmental impact things that are in our own world is going on with them, that's a very important part of this story too. So. But yeah, oh, and the art. The art is very interesting in that it is all black and white and green. Oh. Every panel, black and white and green. And it gives it a very eerie effect, even when it's the, the, like the basically the real world, you know, it's, it makes it a little spookier. Cool, cool. All right, uh, my next title here is uh, 
Something I was uh, anticipating. I saw this in the previews a while back. Um, this is called Soul Stream, and this is issue number one. Soul Stream is an all ages fantasy superhero comic book series about a team of magic wielding teenagers fighting to save another dimension. And this is created by Seda Wolf and published by Scout Comics. It's almost the end of winter break, and Marie is on a reluctant, uh, reluctant hike through the woods with her brother when they discover a mysterious portal and find themselves in another dimension. Marie is contacted by the mage goddess uh, who gives the magical ocean bracelet an item that allows her to transform into the superhero Soul Stream. With her newfound powers and the help of her friends, she embarks on a quest to save the shattered world. Um, Soul Stream here. Uh, what's cool about this here? It has a uh, a single creator, Seda Wolf, who is creator, writer, artist, and everything else. That's what she is credited for. And a cool fact about this is that uh, she is 16 years old, and she made this comic book. Um, that's what kind of drew my attention there. Um, what this one issue is doing is setting up not only the the story of these uh, these two main characters here, once again, walking through the woods, and it's very funny, comical, magical, um, getting transported, transported into these different portals. You meet the, the mage, goddess, um, and just some example of uh, some of the artwork here. It, uh, um, this story is setting up a, uh, the trade paperback release, which I think is coming out this summer. Uh, which is like, a, I think maybe 120 or 140 page trade paperback. Um, I think this is only existing as a one issue, basically uh, debut issue trial run uh, uh, to kind of give you a look at what the series is. It was only 199 and it's a, it's a full comic. And, uh, but yeah, the trade paperback comes out in summer. And while normally I'm not, I would say like the content of this book is more of like the, Katie and Jim world when it comes to the, the fantasies and the Dungeons and Dragons and the mages and all that kind of kind of stuff there but the approach to it gives me a vibe of uh, you know the, the young adult vibe that you would get in like a Lumberjanes book when it comes to like the style of the art um, Kim Reaper the style of that uh, story I think it really kind of captured within this book here so it was very fun uh it definitely feels like something that would be like an animated series on cartoon network or something um but yeah i did really enjoy this first issue and i think i will uh, go ahead and get the trade paperback uh later this summer because uh but yeah it was it was pretty unique i like that that business model too of putting you know a cheap first issue and that just being your your hook and uh to jump it in uh, so yeah, Soul Stream. If you're into that kind of stuff, uh, um, there is a really fun book overall, and once again, an all ages book, so it's pretty good there. So, uh, Soul Stream issue number one from Scout Comics by Seda Wolf. All right, um, then we will jump. As we're in, in between people yes. here, I'm just going to take this opportunity to say goodbye. Um, I got some family stuff going on, so I got to head on out of here. You all have fun and uh, Anthony can let me know when uh, this is done so I can stop the recording and everything. But You're leaving your basement family to go up with the upstairs family. Yep, I, I've, I've got to go run an errand and then uh, we've got something going on with the family. So. Bye. All right. See you all later. All right, sounds good. See ya. All right, uh, then we are going to uh, swing back to Kirby. We're going to do a little... Uh, volley back and forth between you and me for these last titles here just to use a sports term for all the sports nuts out there <laughs> all right i think i picked this up at the crimson cowl uh comic garage sale thing that we had going on this last summer this is sidekick by paul jenkins it's done by image comics i don't have a synopsis in the book but it's like John Romita Jr. His quote is, pick up the damn book and read it. I've met few people as clever, witty, huggable, and funny as Paul Jenkins. Now you all owe me a favor. Cue the theme from The Godfather. Uh, this is really fun. 
he's a character that finds out that superheroes need sidekicks and they're paying money to do it. So he joins up with four different superheroes. He's originally a pizza boy delivery guy. And I like the little promotion that the pizza company does. Where they got, uh, I'm not going to be able to find it now that I'm thinking of it. Yeah, they got these little balloon missiles that you get one with every pizza that you buy. So they tie them to their car and when they're driving, it looks like a bunch of missiles are going to hit the car. <laughs> so, but uh, he starts out as a pizza delivery boy, becomes a sidekick for four characters. The one character is the night ju- judge, which is a, he's a Batman style character that has his issues with grouping up with young boys <laughs> and losing them. And they make fun stuff about that. And his sidekick character for him, when he's sidekick in form, he plays Stoat, which I don't know if that's an actual animal or not, but he looks kind of like a very skinny squirrel character <laughs> in his outfit that he wears. Uh, then a, another guy he joins up with is Brother Commando. And his sidekick character name for him is Bling, where he's got all this rapper stuff on him, all this gold chain stuff. And <laughs> I could see issues with this comic because they use blackface and heroes. <laughs> is very prevalent with that character so someone could complain about that issue but uh they're a fun gang up the next one is the justice queen and pony he plays a cross he's cross he's a cross dresser he dresses up like a girl and for the wonder woman character to play her sidekick and uh she's pr- princess wonder woman type that thinks she's still a 22 year old virgin and, uh, but yet she's like in her 40s i think late 30s 40s uh and then the other character that he joins up with is mr excellent which is like a superman style character kind of a worthless superman style character oh okay that would make sense since it's kind of like a ferret a stole yeah, over yep. jim screen's got the stove yep that would make sense with his outfit that works a lot better uh, the Mr. Excellent character, his sidekick is called Superior Boy, which is like a Superboy sidekick character. Then there's a hobo informant in here that keeps trying to tell him stuff to do and warns him of upcoming uh, tragedies that are going to happen. There's the Stoat character there <laughs> with, his, with his new outfit that his Batman character picked up for him which is just the shorts. <laughs> Watch where you put your fingers there. Uh, <laughs> there's his uh, original con- concept without the shorts. But uh, <laughs> the hobo tries to tell all four characters, hey, there's this Mr. Scruptulous, or whatever that's going to do all these things to the city and they keep ignoring them and the sidekick does some work with the hobo and they gang out there's this Wonder Woman cross dressing the character there. <laughs> and uh, so he tries to get the guys to do that and go after the Dr. Scrup, sir. I can't just say his name today. But uh, so that the bad guy basically ends up working a deal with the sidekick and gets him to work with the bad guy. And then they attack the superheroes and and things keep going around switching back and forth you know, i give out all the stuff for that but uh yeah he's got women that are wearing him down all over the place he has relations with one of the character's wives he's got another woman that is a stripper and she kind of lives with him and his buddy and is constantly ends up taking all his time and wearing him out when he isn't working with the superheroes. But yeah, this was, this was a very fun parody of some of your favorite characters and what it's like to be a sidekick for him. But yeah, I did not expect this to be fun at all. I started reading it and I ended up going through the whole thing without setting it down. So yeah, (laughs) so check that out if you, 
interested in something like that. <laughs> Here I thought I owned that series, but I own Sidekick Singular, uh, which is a very serious comic, uh, very different than that. Oh, that's oh, Singular too. But yeah, yeah, this is the Sidekick also. Okay, yeah, so the one I have is just, it's still Sidekick, but it's definitely not that. So. This one's done by Image and Jenkins, who's his ears done by. This is Image, but from J. Michael Straczynski, and I remember mine being oh. at, uh, it's like a Batman and Robin, um, Batman 66 sort of thing, and I think it's where, like, the Batman type character gets murdered, and I, I it's, it's, it's a much deeper, it's nothing. <laughs> yeah, no, this is all comedy. <laughs> because so. <laughs> yeah you were saying that and i'm just yeah it looks like i've got like the first four issues of i didn't it. enjoy reading mine <laughs> <laughs> yeah because i didn't continue on after issue four i didn't have that much fun but <laughs> if my characters were walking around looking like that in my book i probably would have kept going so <laughs> uh, this was one that i think it was the last sale he had i looked at it every time but just passed it up and then shelly basically grabbed it and i'm like fine i'll take it <laughs> and i'm glad i did good all right uh, my next title here is uh going to be future state immortal wonder woman issue number one um last week's episode i went through just a bunch of the uh future state but i had one more title that i was waiting for actually one of them that i was very much anticipating um the undoing are coming long past the age of heroes few of diana prince's friends survive and most of her sisters have passed as well as an immortal goddess this is her lot but then a threat appears that even the mighty dark side can't handle and it's up to wonder woman to take on the battle um this one I was uh, exceptionally excited for, uh, mostly for uh, the creative team. We've got Becky Cloonan and Michael W. Conrad for the writing team. But then one of my favorite artists, Jen Bartel, uh, does a lot of different covers. So it is an extra treat when you get the interior art from her as well, which she does in this book. So I was actually super excited to see that she was doing the interiors, uh, colors and everything too. Um, so yeah, uh, last week, Jim, you would ask me after the slew of DC Future State books I had read and the ones that you have read, you would ask me, you know, when does this take place? How far in the future? And we tried to pinpoint it. We couldn't really like land on a specific thing, but the opening uh, dialogue in this book gives us that answer. So I hope you're ready for the answer. Uh, this is impossibly long ago in the distant future. There we go. Now it clears it up completely. We know exactly when this takes place. So. <laughs> I read Future State Justice League, and it seemed a lot further ahead than the Future State Batman did. Yeah, so it seems they're all kind of taking their own, just using future yeah. and just going with it. So, I mean, they could do one day later, and it's still the future, so. Is that what the next Batman's about? It's the next day for Batman? I think it, so. it seems pretty much like that, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, because I, I think I read that one too. Um, but yeah, this is Wonder Woman 1, but this is uh, Diana Prince, who is still Wonder Woman with her being immortal, and uh, hence the title of this uh, issue. Uh, what's kind of interesting in the opening pages, the opening scene, it gives me vibes, uh, not as dark, but uh, this, the, the scene setting of uh, Daniel Warren Johnson, Wonder Woman, Dead Earth, because it is Wonder Woman in the Batcave and she's actually talking to the ghost of Batman. And while that all sounds creepy and I had mentioned Wonder Woman, Dead Earth, it's not as creepy as it would sound because this Batman's kind of, he's a little more adorable. He's, he, he's, he's like the Casper of the, of the Batman ghost. Um, but it does open up in that scene and it's talking about the sacrifice that Batman made, but he did it because... Uh, you know, knowing that Wonder Woman, you know, is always going to be there. Um, if there's even a drop of goodness left, it's worth fighting for. You've always been our heart. And that is what's most wonderful about you. That is what Batman said to uh, then a crying Diana Prince as she is uh, left there. And she now wields the, uh, the Batman utility belt. So once again, it gave me those vibes of the of the Dead Earth by Daniel Warren Johnson, but not to the extreme death metal uh, 
heavy metal type of uh, approach to it. Um, this one has a little more uh, brightness, a little more hope. While there is an impending doom, which we do switch over to Apocalypse, we see Darkseid and uh, the New Gods characters. Everyone's kind of dealing with the fact that the worlds are about to end for them. And the Amazon warriors are actually pretty okay with it for the most part. They're not talking about going really going back into war. They're just like, well, this is what we're accepting. Um, Diana is one that's you know basically going to outlive them all, but the other ones are apparently going to die. There's just kind of setting with this impending doom. And there was a cameo in here, uh, a little more so because it kind of is rooted, if you will, throughout the issue. But Swamp Thing is in this book. He is trapped inside this tree in a way, so he's he's not in the the, the man version of Swamp Thing which it's gets into the man. He's not a man thing version of Swamp Thing. Um, uh, so yeah, Swamp Thing is, everyone's counting on Diana basically to, to be the hero, to be the immortal hero. And uh, she's ready to kind of take, take the challenge. But uh, Darkseid does arrive into, uh, um, into Paradise Island here. And there's a huge, just love the art. Uh, Jen Bartel just has this, glowing you know neon you know just illuminating art that she does with her work i've got a couple of her pieces around here i don't think they're in frame here some are just uh over on the other side of the wall but uh um jen bartell actually yeah it's one of her uh, carol danvers is over here uh, right where my finger is pointing right there that's a jen bartell uh doesn't take uh, advantage of the uh of the neons and stuff in that particular one. But yeah, Jen Bartel, just breathtaking art. And to see, you know, it, it's one of those things that, you know, it works perfect in a, in a mini series like this. Cause uh, you know, her art is definitely, she does all the, all the duties for it. And whenever you have, you know, one single artist, it's a, uh, you know, it's a book that you either have to be months ahead of schedule uh, to keep with the release or not. But uh with this one, it's a little easier with the fact that it's a, I assume this one's the two issue series, but yeah, this was fun. If you're a Wonder Woman fan, there's not as much questioning going on what's happening like you would with some of the other books that I uh, talked about last week where you didn't really know a sense of where the characters were sometimes the, not only the time, but even who some of the characters were in the timeline. Uh, this one is a little more um, easy to jump on if you've, uh, if you know Diana, because it is still her in the book. There is a second story in here uh, dealing with, uh, I think, Nubia, um, who is also Wonder Woman. Uh, Nubia, this is a future state story. Um, that's the back half of uh, the book here. This one's done by L.L. McKinney, Althea Martinez, uh, Mark Morales, Emilio Lopez, um, and the rest. But this is a story that one didn't grab me as much because it, it it just kind of threw me into uh, more characters that I didn't really know who they were. The other ones I was just more familiar, but still great art and stuff in the in the back half there. But uh, but yeah, you get a lot of good Wonder Woman goodness in uh, the immortal Wonder Woman from Future State issue numero one. Oh man, that's a those are gorgeous covers. Oh yeah. This is the perfect thing that's literally at my feet right now. I'm not wearing them, but they're sitting on a, on a surfboard here. Um, Jen Bartel uh, designed these Captain Marvel shoes here. Um, so yeah, she even has some of her, uh, you know, with the gold there kind of just her design and stuff like that. So basically anywhere where I walk around in the house, Jen Bartel is following me with her art. So this is just another great piece to, add to the collection all right uh that will be the last of my reviews and uh looks like we'll have one more from kirby what you got there oh yeah gotta keep an eye on david's screen you might see little chucky uh we got little archie and his pals from the team that brought you teeny titans or tiny titans teeny titans. <laughs> little archie Get ready for the triumphant return of our tiny hero himself. It's going to be his wildest day ever. Our young redheaded pal is late for school and without his homework, that might not be unusual, but the reason why sure is. A cat ate his homework, but it's not just an ordinary cat. 
and thanks to a special sneeze, some static electricity, and zombies, this certainly won't be an ordinary day for little Archie and his friends. But yeah, this was by our Art Baltazar and Franco. They, uh, Sabrina starts her day out. Sabrina, teenage witch, is in here. And she wants Salem to, she wants to take a nap. So she sends Salem off to take a nap and puts a little spell on him. So he sleeps for a while. And as you can see, the oh yeah cats come exploding out of her cat, the three different colored ones. And uh, I don't know what happened to two of them because the only one you see in this one is the red cat jumps into Archie's house and goes into Archie's laundry basket and ends up getting tons of uh, static electricity and starts zapping anybody the cat touches and goes and touches Archie's artwork and they say the cat ate the artwork but he didn't eat the artwork he the static electricity made the artwork just explode and disappear so you go he keeps having a bunch of incidents with the static that's attached to him and it's just a fun little story watching him deal with everything in school uh this was a real happy look at the Archie and the gangs after all the more adult Archie stuff that I've been reading. I'm finally getting back to some childhood type ones that are a little bit more fun. So that, that made me really happy. And I love, love how Jughead is constantly with his burgers. He's shaking trees and burgers are falling out of the trees for each character when they come up and want one. He's got a whole drawer full of burgers hidden in the principal's desk drawer lower desk drawer and the, he doesn't know that the principal knows and the principal's eating his burgers too throughout the day <laughs> but yeah this is this was just a very fun enjoyable run i wanted to throw something in there that was family fr friendly for everybody of all ages so still doing great haven't found one that i haven't liked by the the duo so oh yeah comics check any other little dudes out this was fun so, and it was a one shot. So, good. good. All right. That is going to do it for the weekly reviews. Uh, let's jump over to the letters page. All right. We are saved. And you wanted to go last, Kirby. Is that correct? Um, my screen wasn't on the video. Uh, did you say yes to that? You want to go last? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I put my head up and down. <laughs> I wasn't on. I was on my podcast stream, so I wasn't on the yeah. Zoom. So uh, that makes sense. <laughs> I was between the panels, if you will. Between the sheets. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Here we go. Yeah, recording audio. Okay. <clears throat> Welcome to the letters page. This week's question for everybody to answer, except for David. He got out again. Uh, in the spirit of WandaVision, streaming now on Disney+, Plus, what two characters would you give the sitcom treatment to for a television show? Um, my two characters, I do have some supporting cast of there, but the main characters is going to take Laura Kinney, a.k.a. X-23, a.k.a. the all-new Wolverine, uh, who was known for a time in Marvel Comics a couple years ago, as well as Gabby, her clone, her daughter-slash-sister clone, however you want to categorize it, uh, a.k.a. Honey Badger. Um, the all-new Wolverine series with those two was just so much fun. It was very comedy driven, but still had a lot of real serious action and stuff. So I think if you had Laura Kinney and Gabby together in a sitcom going through the decades and uh, and focusing on you know laugh tracks and, and certain things like that, I think that would just be uh, a perfect setting for those characters because they were almost doing that already within their own book. Um, the supporting cast definitely is going to fill out the Wolverine house there there because they're all cloned from uh, Wolverine and uh, 
so you're going to have to include uh, Wolverine himself. Uh, he's back from the dead anyways, so that's perfect. So current timeline Wolverine. Bring back old man Logan, who was in the book for a while. They, there are issues where all these characters are in like the same house, and it was, it was might have been like an issue or two where they're all kind of working together. So like we already had all of the groundwork and uh, of that show right there. And then of course um, you have to have the family, uh, the last family member, family pet. You got Jonathan, who was the actual Wolverine in that story. That was Gabby's pet. So all of those characters throwing a laugh track. You got my money for at least six seasons in a movie. So that is my choice. Um, Damon, do you have an answer to this question? Yeah, but it's kind of a repeat of the last letters I was in. I don't know why, but I keep coming back to these characters, maybe because they're my favorite. But And of course, because it's me, I have to do two different answers. <laughs> so... If we're doing a, a, a take on like WandaVision, I keep just coming back to Howard the Duck and Golden Girl from uh, the Black Hammer universe. <laughs> just because they both be the same height, they both smoke, they both drink, they both have attitude. Um, I think that'd be uh, a lot of fun, especially if you introduce like not so smart neighbors and stuff and have them interact and these two just going you know off sarcastically. I think it'd be a lot of fun. Um, I think it'd be even more fun if we kind of merged from WandaVision, this is my second answer, into like a rehash of Three's a Company, only two guys and one girl. And same two characters, Howard the Duck and Golden Girl, but now add Hellboy. There we go. <laughs> and I can just picture all three of them sitting on a couch, um, smoking, drinking, and, and just, you know, having a blast. I think that'd be, that'd be fun. I'd watch your show, sir. So, all so, right, uh, let's jump over to Katie. What do you got for the answer in this one? Okay, so I'm gonna do uh, Eddie Brock and Venom, and my sitcom is gonna be they are roommates. So all the funny stuff you can do with that, and then for a maybe darker episode, uh, if Venom is merged with him, we can have Eddie like talking with him and arguing and fighting and everyone's like, wow, this guy is crazy because they can't see what's going on. Um, so that's what I would do. That would make for uh, if you go to classic sitcoms and stuff when they'll usually have the episode where like the the siblings will get in a fight and they have to split the room in half and put tape down the middle or put a rope down the middle. Imagine doing that with Venom, you know, that's just a that writes itself right there. So Yeah, that would be absolutely perfect. I love it. That would be good for Two-Face, too, to have a sitcom with himself. So. Oh, yeah. Good point. <laughs> Hopefully I didn't steal Jim's answer. Uh, Jim, what you got there? Well, not exactly, because I was thinking Batman and Robin. But not like we, you, you, we're used to seeing them. I would like make it nice and bright and colorful. And uh, make it like uh, have it ha the action happen during the daytime, and have the villains be just like really, really silly, mm. and have like all these you know comic book sound effects and oh, this is believable all I... that going on. No, you and know, really, and full of puns. You know what your show is missing though, because like you would go to an executive boardroom. You lay down your pitch and people are probably starting to yawn and just like looking at their phone and doing their Scrabble moves and farm bills, trades and stuff. And uh, you're going to realize you're missing one extra ingredient that's going to sell this show. Give one of those, like maybe, how about Robin, the younger character? Give him like an old aunt to just be there for some reason. Um, just throwing out a name, Harriet. Let's let's throw in an Aunt Harriet or something. Maybe you got a show. Sounds great. Let's do it. <laughs> All right, I would buy that in a three di uh, three season giant Blu-ray box set with a with maybe a Matchbox replica Batmobile or something. <laughs> okay, uh, Kirby, uh, what's your answer? Or All right. I got about 10 answers. <laughs> I did. I went this, I, went, I guess I went a different route from everybody. I was thinking, I love Howard the Duck and Leah Thompson. 
So I'd like to see them do a Mork and Mindy style TV show because you could have the egg, the duck landing on Earth, all that stuff. I thought that'd be a fun little run up because you can't split them up. They belong together. And then you got I Love Lucy style show that I'd like to see done with Elvira, but Elvira is the Ricky character because she's the entertainer. And the Lucy character would be played by Brad Pitt because <laughs> she's always obsessed with Brad Pitt and he could play a great goofy character in there. I think that'd be a perfect team up. Then for a my favorite Martian look, I'd like to see Wolverine join up with Dupe. I loved what they did in their little series. I, I could see that being a fun thing. Dupe could change himself around try and make himself look more human, dress up and stuff like that. That'd be a fun little show. Mr. Ed Flipper style show. And I stuck with the older ones because we were talking WandaVision. So that just stuck in my head as the older shows. But Deadpool with Jeff the Land Shark. I think that would be a fun little team up. <laughs> Playing like Mr. Ed. And then... Loki and Wolverine, I really enjoyed their little short run thing that I read. I can't remember what it was back a while back, but I think they'd be great as a perfect strangers style team up. <laughs> oh, don't be ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> and then stick with the Art and Franco characters. I'd like to see a little, little Wolvie, little Wolverine, gone little Wolvie. Put him, team him up with bats and you got yourself a Lassie show. And then I only got three more here, so just bear with me. <laughs> Sabrina and Harvey. I think those two would make a great Bewitched team up. Spider-Man and Mary Jane. You got Mary Jane as the redhead. There you got married with children. <laughs> it's like Spider-Man's funny. I could see Peter Parker doing that up. And I, I could see that being a good comedy. Yeah, Mary Jane's just sitting on the couch eating bonbons. Yeah. Then my original one, my favorite one, putting Deadpool and Spider-Man together as bosom buddies. <laughs> yeah, that'd be hilarious. Watching those two goofing around together, cross-dressing. <laughs> it seems like Deadpool's <laughs> idea for all of those answers. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and he's, he's so comedic. He's, he's the mojo making all these yeah. shows. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's... <laughs> well, you covered for anybody that didn't show up today, so that's perfect. So, <laughs> I would I would watch every single one of those shows and all the ones that we all said. I think they're... Except for Jim's. His is the one that's most far-fetched and un <laughs> unbelievable. <so. laughs> okay, um... That is going to do it for this week's... Uh, did you want to jump into the pocket dimension? Oh, we've well, done two hours. I can always do it next time or whatever. It's up to you. Let's do it now. Let, well, whoa, we're going into the pocket dimension. Okay, we'll start off quick with an oldie, but a goodie. I'm sure Anthony got this because I know he's got the one pop character. But this is a thing they do with the different monthly boxes. I found this online, minus the shirt. But it comes it with the Kamala Khan patch. Oh, yeah. And you got the Spider Woman button. And it's like, I didn't want none of these extra things. I wanted it for one thing, of course. But you get the little card stock that comes with it, showing you all the stuff that came in it. You get a special cover Civil, Civil War II comic book with all, almost all the characters on it. They don't have the good one. There's two, two little bobbleheads that come in here. You get She-Hulk, cool little She-Hulk one. And Captain Marvel. Which I don't know if this was a special one or not. Did you get the whole box, Anthony? Yes, I did. I, uh... My this Captain Mar Marvel has little see-through hand flames, but on the box it shows solid flames. Yeah, I've okay. got the see-through ones, so. Yeah, so that must have been normal. Then the reason I bought it, of course, was for the squirrel girl with the tippy toe. 
<laughs> yep, yep. The, got the little tippy toe figure in there and say so I just had to have that for my collection. I think that was the exact reason when I got it too, because like I think people had revealed while it's a mystery, I think people had revealed what it was gonna be. And once I saw the pop, I'm like, all right, the pop's gonna cost me like fifty bucks to buy it on eBay, so I might as well just get the whole box, which you know, is all stuff I wanted anyway. So. And then today I got a couple things in the mail. These I already reviewed number one through three of Marvel Zombies Resurrection, but I had to get this one for the cover. It's got your cell phone thing with a picture of Miss Marvel and Squirrel Girl all zombified. It's got a zombified Frankenstein tippy toe in there. So I had to get that. And then of course, number four, I got the Rocket and Groot zombified cover. So that's, I just had to pick those up. But I was happy to open up a box today for my Elvira Kickstarter came in the mail. And it comes with a comic book, which I'm not going to talk about on here. I did read it before the podcast. But if you want to hear the review of this, well, then you'll have to come to Under the Call of MS, because that's where this one will be reviewed. Great it fun. came with an Elvira pen. And... <laughs> yeah. When did yours come, Kirby? Because I haven't received mine yet. It came today. Okay. Did you ever get the link for all her digital content? Uh, yeah, I think so. I'm pretty sure I got a couple links on the digital. But I'd have to go back and look. But I didn't even get that yet. <laughs> got a postcard. Yeah. Bookmark. A uh, little sticker. And then I need the book. <laughs> variety of different playing cards. Did you get yours autographed? Yes. Yes, mine is autographed inside. Cool. cool. But yeah, that I was very happy to see that. That was another one where you got lots of extras and stuff, so. So, <laughs> I can't keep track of all the Kickstarters I've been doing lately. I got to quit. Anthony would quit sending me these damn messages. <laughs> keep. I think I found four more the other day because of him. But, but yeah, that's it. And that, that's what's fun about the Kickstarters too is that after you do it, you know, it could be quite a while till they show up, so you forget about them. So it's actually is quite a surprise when you start opening up and looking at all the goodies. So. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Um, anyone else while we are still in the pocket dimension? Did you find anything here? Sure. I'll do one. <laughs> uh, I'll talk about one of my weirder pieces of Lord of the Rings Hobbit merchandise. <laughs> um, and it's, it's sad that I have this on hand. Um, I have a menu from Denny's from when The Hobbit and Unexpected Journey was released in theaters. Of all the places, apparently Warner Brothers decided they were going to partner with Denny's, the 24-7 diner, to do a Hobbit-themed menu. And I went there to eat breakfast. Um, and I did ask if we could keep this menu in the placemat. And the person who was working there gave me a very weird look, but they're like, yeah, I guess. Um, so you can build your own Hobbit slam. Um, welcome to Middle Earth's Diner is their, their slogan. Uh, you can get the One Ring Burger, Hobbit Hole Breakfast, Shire Sausage Skillet, Gandalf's Gobble Melt, Dwarves Turkey and Dressing Dinner, and Frodo's Pot Roast Skillet. Um, what else can you get? Lonely Mountain Treasure, which appears to be um, French toast and icing. Uh, Bilbo's Berry Smoothie. And of course, uh, pie, Hobbit, just generic Hobbit Harvest Pie. Um, so yeah, that's a thing. Uh, probably one of the odder pieces of merch that I have, but it was really fun at the time and it was exciting. It was a great story. And, um, you know, maybe after I'm long gone and someone is cleaning out my house, they'll, they'll find this and be like, what the heck is that? And it will make them laugh or make them cringe or maybe, maybe just a tiny little bit be happy. But uh, anyway, in in uh, the category of Hobbit merch, we have a menu from Denny's. I got it. You said you went for breakfast? Yes. 
But did you have second breakfast? I sure did. I did it on purpose. I made sure when I woke up that day, I had like, you know, some fruit or something reasonable so that, yes, I would in fact be having second breakfast. Did the okay. one ring burger come with one onion ring on it? You know, that's a great question. Oh. Let's look. There is a picture here. No, in the picture, they have like two onion rings. That's heresy. Ah, they missed all It is a hand. They did. They did. It's a hand pressed burger topped with pepper jack cheese, bacon, sauteed mushrooms, and mayo on a grilled cheddar cheese bun, crowned with these crispy onion rings and served with lettuce, tomato, red onions, pickles, and a side of fries. Dwarves and Hobbits dig in for $8.49. You're right. You're right. Wow. Nice medium sized onion ring that could actually stick on your finger. Yes. <laughs> you're correct. Wow. That was a missed opportunity. One ring to grill them all. <laughs> One ring to fry them. One ring to bring them all and in the heart attacks find them. In the land of Denny's where the shadows lie. <laughs> and I think that's going to do it for our show. Anyone else before the pocket dimension closes? Okay. Oh, it's closing up. Oh, there's the noise that you heard on the audio podcast, which I don't know if David puts in the video, but here we are. Um, so, yep, that was our show. Um, within the next week or two, we will cover the final issue of the current Batman The Adventures Continue run, which is issue number eight. Uh, ink blot number six and crossover number four will happen uh, sometime in the month of uh, February uh, once we all get our copies. So, uh, subscribe to us on all the channels where you get your podcast. Um, over on YouTube, Crimson, Crimson Cowl Comics on uh, YouTube as well. So you can uh, get the visual of some of the pocket dimension items that are brought here and some of the panels and everything that we uh, show off. Uh, then we have a couple uh, spin-off podcasts, if you will. There's Under the Cowl, which uh, co-hosted by myself and David. Um, that is for mature, mature audiences, kind of talking about a bunch of random stuff, uh, mostly in pop culture, but it basically anything there's no rules over there then there's another podcast that kirby does which is called under the call of ms coming up on uh, episode 100 very shortly so uh yeah there's uh, a lot of episodes out there so you can check that out and a couple new segments in the in the last couple episodes that were posted um so things are always being uh, shaken up over there uh, keep things fun and uh all the variety you can find that over at under the call of ms um and i think that is everything we want to say so it's time to close this podcast this entire time i've never really been much for capes <laughs> damon sat here and forgot to unmute my mic <laughs> i have been frosty the bloody gut ghost I've been punching clankers with the wolf pack. I'm bored. Can't we do some crimes and junk? What's that now about a horse? To be continued. <laughs>